Good morning and welcome to another Total Education Centre lecture. The series that we're about to begin today is about Hamlet. Of course, Hamlet's one of Shakespeare's classic and long-lived plays. And this first lecture is going to talk and, and set the context of the play and we're going to set up the rest of the lecture series. The rest of the lecture series will cover things such as Hamlet's character and, and the procrastination issue. We're going to look at different interpretations and readings of the play, we're going to look at, of course, themes and absolutely language. So look for those in the future and see how you go with those. I'd like to start today by putting the play in context and in some ways I don't want to spend too much time talking about Shakespeare's life and all those sorts of things. You can find plenty of that on the internet and you can look up Elizabethan times and you need a little bit of context on Elizabethan times but don't get caught up too much in that. You might want to think about the natural order and the restoration of order and that's important in the context of play and some of the values that come out in the play later are relevant for that. What I'd like to focus on today is the sense of tragedy and talk about tragedy and I'd also in the latter part of it like to focus on some of the different interpretations of, of how Shakespeare comes in and gets involved in that um, sense of tragedy. Now tragedy in British theatre has an extremely long history going way way back probably to the 15th century or earlier. And the revenge tragedy plays are, are very dark and bloody. And this is a very typical sort of revenge tragedy. And it comes within the context of, of tragedies as a group of plays. And I'd just like to talk about that for a moment to give you some kind of idea where Hamlet fits into that. And I think that will assist you to talk about the issues later in the play and the things that are going to be important and how you perceive and interpret the play. The ingredients of revenge, or the, the, the sort of you know, common ideas that centre around revenge, are first of all the hesitating revenger, and, and there's a reason for that hesitation, and we'll talk about that of course when we look at Hamlet, and I'll spend a whole lot of time talking about Hamlet. Um, there needs to be a villain, there needs to be someone who does it, in this case obviously it's Claudius, and his poisoning of Hamlet's father, and those issues that surround that, and the cowardice behind that. There's a lot of complex plotting and we do see that in Hamlet. Hamlet's a very long play and if you actually perform Hamlet and the whole of Hamlet, it's about four hours on stage and very rarely do you see a production of that nature and we'll talk about productions later. There's murders of course and of course in this tragedy everybody dies and I don't think that's a plot spoiler. I think everybody would understand that death is very important in this play. What else do we have? We have characters of noble birth so that their rise and fall is significant although not so much with Hamlet because we don't really see his rise and fall at the start of the play. We see Hamlet as this sort of upset, subdued, mourning son. We never see him really at his peak until the end of the play, in my opinion. We see the old the play within the play, and of course we get that here with the play performed at the end. We see the ghost, and I'll talk about the ghost in probably um, another separate lecture because the ghost is extremely important in here and is the catalyst for much of the action and and Shakespeare does very different things with, with his ghost to what we normally see in the Revenge Tragedy series. We see a suffering heroine, of course, Ophelia in this case, commits suicide, um, a long suffering Ophelia, and we'll talk about her, of course. We get madness, real and feigned, and we, and we certainly see that in this play, especially with Hamlet. There's, often there's lust, and, and we don't really see that so much in this play although there are, there are hints at it and we see little bits of um, relationships developing. And the final thing in the revenge tragedy is this, the physical horrors such as, as torture and poisoning and those sorts of things. And of course we do see that in this play and there's lots of, there's lots of death and there's lots of pain and there's, there's suffering and there is the poisoning at the end and, and all those sorts of things which, which Shakespearean audiences in their context really liked and approved of. And I think that those things are extremely important. And I'll put, I'll put those at a list in, in the notes at the end of this lecture. But for a full development of those ideas and for a really full analysis of um, Hamlet as a play and how it relates, you could go to our website and have a look at the lecture by our European correspondent, Lewis Mitchell, on Hamlet. And that's a full hour lecture. You can download that. Um, and there's notes that go with that as well. Now I'd like to talk about the nature of tragedy and probably there's been a lot of discussion over time with different critical references to how 
we interpret Hamlet as a tragedy. Is it a revenge tragedy? Does it have a hero? All those sorts of issues that go back to, to the values and the context of the play. And I'd like to look at Shakespeare's life, sorry, Hamlet's context in the play, both historically and both as different readings through time. And I'll start by probably looking at what the nature of tragedy is. And now we know the background to that sense of tragedy. And I'll probably focus on what A.C. Bradley, in fact, I will focus on what A.C. Bradley, that great Shakespearean critic, um, and who starts many of the great debates of, about Shakespearean plays, talks about tragedy and what Shakespearean tragedy specifically does. And I'll place Shakespearean tragedy within that context. And then what I'll do is move on to have a look at how Hamlet specifically fits into that Shakespearean context, both as a play and as a character. And then I'll probably move on to discussing this procrastination in the next lecture. The first thing that Bradley talks about when he talks about Shakespearean tragedy is that the Shakespearean tragedy brings to us a large number of persons. In other words, it, it, it's a big cast and a big play and very lengthy and very, very um, well developed over those five acts but it is essentially still the story of one person. And we know this from the title of the play, it's called Hamlet. It's not called The Revenger's Tragedy or anything like that. It's about Hamlet and specifically about him. And I think it's important to keep that focus on Hamlet because we can get sidetracked with all so many other issues in the play. Um, and, and I'll also talk about later if Hamlet's the hero of the play in the true sense of the word, and perhaps he might have been in that context is certainly not in our context. Um, there's a lot of debate about that and you can, you'll need to make up your mind and decide for yourself. So what else does Bradley say? The story leads to and includes the death of the hero in the inverted commas. Also, the story depicts the troubled part of the hero's life that precedes and produces his death. And we certainly get that in Hamlet. We see the problem that he faces, the, the, the ghost of his father gives him that task to perform. And he needs to perform that and it takes him an awful long time to do it. Um, an accidental death is not part of Shakespearean tragedy at all. It has to be reasoned and it has to be logical and it has to develop. So there's no you know, getting stabbed accidentally or getting killed in England as he doesn't do when he comes back. Um, the next issue is that the suffering and calamity and the effects of that tragedy and revenge are extremely large and important. In this case, obviously, it involves a whole nation. Um, they befall a conspicuous person, either a king or a prince, as in this case, or someone important. The higher the, 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 higher the position, the more terrible the fall in some ways. Well, they are themselves striking individual characters, and I think no matter what you think of Hamlet, he certainly is a striking and very individual character in the play. They are contrasted with and arise out of um, something that's happened before. For example, um, happiness, security, glory, something that's been done before. And they, they come out of that background. They usually extend beyond the hero and affect a large number of people, people frequently a whole nation. So there's some of the elements that Bradley picked out in that Shakespearean history that's extremely important. Um, the next point that he makes, and this is probably uh, the most important in relation to Hamlet, he says that the catastrophe is not something which merely happens to the people concerned, but rather something which is caused by them. So there's some, there's people are placed in situations and it's how they react and how they respond to those situations which creates the problems and the conflict and everything that's interesting about the play. In doing that, he introduces several specific factors to Shakespearean tragedy that aren't seen in a lot of other tragedy, and certainly Shakespeare was the forerunner of these sort of elements. He shows abnormal states of mind, and I think obviously we can see that in Hamlet very clearly where he does have those certainly abnormal states of mind. As I pointed out in tragedy previously, there's that sense of madness he includes the supernatural, in this case obviously the ghost. In Macbeth we had the witches, those sorts of things. Chance and accident are also very important and they do play a considerable influence at times, although it does come back to the character itself. The next point that Bradley makes is that the tragic hero for Shakespeare is not merely a person of public importance, 
He's built of the same stuff as we are, but on a grand scale. If we are to sympathise with him, we must feel that in similar circumstances we might have made the same mistakes. We must be able to say in our hearts, there but for the grace of God go I. The hero need not be a good man as such, but it is necessarily that he should have nobility in him, so that in his mistake and fall we may see the possibilities of human nature. And I think that's where, you, if, you, if you think about that point very clearly and look at that, you'll see that's where the values in the play lie in many ways. Obviously that leads us directly into talking about the point that Bradley makes very clear in his work, the fatal flaw of a Shakespearean character. And that fatal flaw is the fatal tendency to subordinate the whole man to one interest, passion or habit of mind. So for example in Othello it's jealousy. Um, in Macbeth, it's ambition. So we need to look for and find that in Hamlet and what, what that fatal flaw in his Hamlet. And many people would say it's his procrastination and lack of ability to, to decide and act. Obviously, in any tragedy or in any drama or theatre or so, ever, the final point that Bradley makes is we need conflict. So in this play, we're going to look specifically at internal conflict and external conflict. And we see lots, and when we talk about Hamlet, of course, we'll talk about all that deep internal conflict that he has, and that the, the external conflicts that put pressure on those internal conflicts and vice versa, and the actions and, and reactions that happen. Obviously, a lot of character, a lot of critics have talked about whether Hamlet is a hero in that true sense. And I just want to touch on that um, very, very briefly and decide. Is he a hero or not? And I think it's something that you can say yes he is or yes he is and have lots of evidence to support your ideas. I don't think he's a hero in the modern sense of the word hero. The great saviour and the great person that comes across and does all those things. But I do think in many ways that he has worked his way um, into a sort of heroic sense. And if we look at that inner conflict and those abilities and inner, inner desires that he has and, and think back to Bradley's points, then we actually get those very, very clearly. Um, he's, he's, he's a hero in, in many ways, I suppose, if you think about, um, he's, he's already in mourning at the start of the play, he's not at his peak, he's not at his, his zenith as, as a tragic you know, character, he's, he's suffering a little bit. What else is there about him? Um, the villain seems to create the action, not Hamlet at this stage, and um, this is continuous throughout the play. It's, it seems to be that everybody else creates the action around Hamlet and he doesn't really make it. So he's not heroic in the sense that he creates action and makes movements in that way. Um, he doesn't really go through a fall in the play either. He's not a great figure that suffers a, that suffers a fall, such as Othello or such as Macbeth, who worked their way up to, the, to some of the highest positions in the land. Um, the test for him is to rise to that occasion. I mean, some critics argue that he does in the end, but um, he never acts dishonourably as such, and he, always, he certainly always thinks through what he does, and you need to decide whether that's a heroic trait or not. We also need to consider the fact in that sense of heroism that, yes, he does achieve what he's supposed to do in the end, and his revenge is achieved, and I think the final act of the play, while he, you know, of course, dies, and, and there's a sense of irony in that, we need to think about that, that idea of revenge as it is. So that's really what Bradley has analysed and talked about in the play, and, and that's what he's, his ideas about Shakespeare and tragedy. And I think those sort of ideas, if you follow those through and lead you through, that will give you a better way to approach the value. So that's a little bit of the context in that sense. If we look at it contextually and we look at it sort of historically, there are um, conflicting attitudes to the notion of revenge in Shakespearean times at all. In fact, in Shakespearean times, on one hand, the law says you can't take revenge, you can't take the law into your own hands, but it's seen as, as an honour to do so. So there's a little bit of conflict in that, and I think that conflict comes out in Hamlet, and I think that's very important. Um, and there was lots of justifications for revenge, and I think that's what Hamlet does. I think he needs to go through that process of justifying what he does. Um, and certainly, if you want to read, there are many sub 
Salgado writes extensively on that. You can probably look that stuff up on the internet and I'll put his name in the notes at the end of this lecture. And I think you should probably find those for yourself. So what else is there? In traditional revenge tragedy, the taking of revenge is seen as a sin which corrupts the revenger and secures his damnation. But this is not so in Hamlet. In the context of Hamlet, there is hardly anything to show that the prince's hesitation in killing the king is the result of scruples over moral justification of revenge. Um, he seems to assume automatically that he should kill the king, he just can't work out really when and how and why to do it. It's important um, that we think about, he doesn't want to suffer to his passions a slave, I suppose, if you like to call that, but he needs to work it and do it. Um, I think that if you look really carefully and read the play very carefully, you'll see that the, the, the sea journey changes him and he comes back. And that's one of those sort of metaphorical journeys that, that where the character changes and he comes back a little bit different. And the action seems to speed up for him after that. And many critics have pointed to that as a turning point in the play, you might like to think about that where you go. The, the idea that Hamlet is, is focused very clearly on that sense of revenge comes through in, in, in the historical context and the view that the revenger's role was, was really a waiting role and he had to wait for that perfect opportunity and I think yes he does that and there's a big sense of the irony in the end of the play that you don't see in, in the non-Shakespearean sort of tragedy that he takes so long to do it, but he is so certainly so successful in his own death is that irony touch. That, and I think that Helen Gardner points that out. She, she wrote a, a very good piece on the historical approach to Hamlet, and I'll probably talk about that a little bit later when we look at he, that, that sense of the waiting role in, in historical terms. But for now, I think we probably need to, to wrap this up. It's getting a little bit long. I hope that's given you some of the context of the play. Don't forget the lecture by Lewis Mitchell on our website and the notes that go with that will certainly assist you further to extend your knowledge uh, of the play. And it talks about different readings and things and you can get the notes for that. There are a few slides at the end of this lecture. Don't forget to read those and get this, some of the information and some of the talks and some of the articles that I referred to in here at the end. Don't forget, please press the like button down below. That will help us. I'm Bruce Pattinson from the Total Education Centre. Thank you for watching this first lecture on Hamlet.